Hi, this is part two in my series on beam calculations. So in this part, we're going to look at beam supports um, and different types of beams. So some of the terms that we use for those. Um, and then we're going to look at two different styles of calculations, one involving a type of beam known as a cantilever beam. Uh, and also what we're going to do is look at different types of loads. So when we have a load that's known as a distributed load, how do we deal with that? Okay, so we have different types of beams, and in our last section we looked at a couple. So we had one that was known as a simple beam, or simply supported beam. And usually that looks like two supports with some sort of loads in the middle. Um, we also did the question which had a uh, bearing and a shaft, and that was an example of an overhanging beam. So we had loads that weren't within the two reactions, but we had one that hung over. Okay, Both of those have the same idea. We have some unknown supports, and those are going to be providing some sort of force to hold the beam in place. Okay. We also have two other types of beams. Um, the one that you guys will be concentrating on is a cantilever beam. And a cantilever beam, instead of having two spots where it's supported, is support it in just one place. And in this diagram, we've supported the cantilever beam with a wall. And the wall is a little uh, different than just the standard supports because it provides not only a resistance to the beam falling up and down, but also it has to stop it from rotating. So this beam not only has a force attached to it, but it also has a moment. So this is a, a little different, and we'll do some examples of that. Um, if we had a beam that was locked in place between two walls, then you have a moment on each end and reactions on each end. This becomes a much more complicated problem. So we don't use those at the third class level. So all you need to be able to do is be able to analyze either a simple beam, a overhanging beam, or a cantilever beam. We also have a few different types of supports. So when we drew our beams, what we showed uh, were, I guess I put triangles in the last section uh, as our supports, uh, or else we had the bearings. And really what we could do is, is be a little more careful on those. So we may use different types of supports. For instance, we may have a roller. So if we had a beam and it was able to roll side to side because it had a roller on it, um, it wouldn't provide any resistance to horizontal loads. It would only provide a vertical load. So we have a roller support and it only has a force that would move upwards as a reaction. The pinned connection would be one where we have a pivot point there. And so that pivot point could still allow rotation. However, it won't allow that beam to move both up and down or side to side. So that pin support has two reaction components. And if we look at the fixed component, it has three uh, unknowns. So it can't move up or down or side to side, just like a pin support, but it also provides some rigidity to that structure and it won't allow it to pivot either. So it provides a reaction to stop it from rotating. However, when we talk about our third class work, um, we don't have horizontal loadings included with the beams. So we don't have these extra reactions and really what we have is either one unknown for a roller or, or a pin if we eliminate all horizontal loads. Um, and if we look at our wall, then really at a fixed connection, we only have two loads or two reactions. Okay, so we're going to do an example where we look at a cantilever beam. Okay, so I have a cantilever beam and I have asked you to provide me the free body diagram, FBD, free body diagram for the following beam, and determine the reactions at the wall. OK, 
Okay, so what we're going to do is uh, when I ask for a free body diagram, I guess I would ask for a little sketch of what does this look like. So we don't include the wall. So at this end, we don't include the wall um, in our free body diagram because we just have this object that's floating out in space. Okay, so if it's floating out in space, um, I still have my 900 newtons that is pushing down on it. And if this thing is going to be sitting out in space, um, that object was in equilibrium previously. So in order for it to stay in equilibrium, I have to have some wall supports. So if I look at what's happening at the wall, the wall has to resist the 900 newton sets pushing downwards. So my wall has to provide me with a reaction upwards. Okay, so I may call that as a R. My wall also has to stop this from rotating because if it was just left like this, these guys create what's known as a couple and they tend to create some rotation. So what we want to do is we want to provide a resistance to that. So my wall is going to create a resistance to that, which is an M. So my free body diagram would include both of the reactions at the wall. Okay, so if I wanted to find what the value of those were, well, I go back to my equations of equilibrium. So um, if I recall my equations of equilibrium, I have sum of moments in one direction has to equal some moments in the alternate direction. Uh, and I also have sum of forces up has to equal sum of forces down. Okay. When we had a simply supported beam, I encouraged you to always start with the moment. Okay. Always start with the moment calculation because it's going to allow you to eliminate one of your variables. This one, um, again, as long as we are good about picking a good smart point to start with, then we can eliminate one of our variables in either equation. So it doesn't matter which one we start with when we have a cantilever beam. Okay. Um, so uh, maybe we'll start out with the forces up is equal to forces down. Okay. So if we look at what's going up, um, I have an R. Okay. So I have R and I'll keep moving her across the beam from one end to the other. And I have also a 900, it's in the downwards direction, so it's going to be on the right-hand side. And uh, in this case, without any real math, I have found one of my reactions. When I look at my moments, we recall last time that one of the big things was picking an appropriate point, which meant that I would eliminate one of my unknowns. And if I eliminate one of my unknowns by making it essentially at a distance of zero from that pivot point or that, re, uh, that reference point, then it makes the math much easier. Okay? And so in this case, if I go back to my beam, um, well, th the point that I'm going to take is right next to the wall or where I've essentially sliced that beam. So it's floating in space now. And on a cantilever beam, I'm going to take that point all the time. So where that slice is at the wall. And my cantilever beam now um, will be calculated, or my moments will be calculated. And my R value is at a distance of 0. Okay. Students often, often, often pick different points. And when they do, almost every single time they forget to include an R value. Because if it's not at the ball, that distance is no longer zero. So always take it at the wall or be aware that there's a real likelihood you're going to make a mistake in this problem if you're not 
really, really careful to account for every single force. So we have our R value at the wall, um, and it's at a distance of zero, so it's going to be eliminated. Um, so I'm going to just start working my way from my point across. So I'm going to start at my reference point, and what I'll see is I have an M at my reference point. And I have to include that when I calculate all of my M's. And that M is in the counterclockwise direction. So I'm going to put him in on my counterclockwise side. I don't know what he is, but he's going to stay there as an M. And if I continue across my beam, I will get to a 900 Newton. And uh, if I go back to my drawing, I guess he was at 2.6 meters. So 900 Newtons at 2.6 meters is going to be equal to M. So 900 times 2.6. So 2340 Newton meters is going to be equal to M. Okay. The cantilever beam looks more complicated, but actually the math is easier for them. We usually can get to one answer pretty quickly in each case, forces or moments. And as long as we're careful about following the same rules as we established in our simply supported beam and drawing a good free body diagram to start with, we should have no problems with cantilever beams. There's nothing different about them and the math is easier. Okay, so here's a little more complicated cantilever beam. Still is about the same. We're going to still follow the same process, but this one has three loads that are on it. So we have uh, three loads. We have a 1500 Newton load, we have a 500 Newton load, and a 1000 Newton load. So we'll have a few more steps, but uh, again, we're going to follow the same sort of process for drawing out and um, calculating this beam. So first thing that we're going to do is we're going to draw our free body diagram. Okay, and I'll just draw it down here. And I have 1,000. I'm going to put on all of my known forces, 500. And I have 1,500 Newtons. Okay, so I guess those are all Newtons. Okay. And um, essentially what I've done is I've cut at the wall so that this thing can be free floating. So remove the wall. Now the wall provides me with some reactions, so I'm going to call this R, and I'm going to call this M. Now it's given to you in the problem, the R and the M, but it's always a good practice to make sure you remember those. Um, lots of times where we make mistakes missing those reactions at the wall. I'm going to pick my pivot point, and as you recall, a good or the best or really the only choice of pivot point for a cantilever beam is to take that point as the cut or where the wall was. Okay, so we're going to take that, and if we recall back to our steps that we took with our simply supported beam, we drew out all of our dimensions from our reference point. So to the first one uh, was one meter, to the next one would be two and a half meters, and then to the final would be four meters. Okay, so I'm going to take that into account. And then we can start to do our math. So we have two equations, sum of forces up are going to equal all of our forces down, and we have sum of moments in one direction has to equal sum of moments in the other direction. Okay, so um, I can do either one, and sometimes on a cantilever beam it's easier to do the forces first. So forces up, uh, I'm just going to take an inventory and I'm going to start from my reference point and work my way across. 
So first thing I come to is my R, and it's in the upwards direction, so I'm going to put it on the up side. Okay, I'm going to keep coming across, and I get to 1,000, and it's in the downwards direction. Next one, 500, in the downwards direction. And then finally I get to the end, and I get to 1,500, and it is... 1500 newtons and it is again in the downwards direction um and so at this point just a little bit of math 1000 plus 500 plus 1500 gives me an r value of 3000 newtons the idea of taking the pivot point at the wall means that when i do my moments my R, which is now 3,000 newtons, is going to be at a distance of zero, so it doesn't even come into the calculations at all. So I'm going to do my moments, and once again, I'm going to start at my wall and work my way across. Very important not to miss my M value, which is sitting at the wall, and it's in the counterclockwise direction, so it's going to be on this side of the equation. And then I keep working my way across and looking for forces. 1,000 Newton is going to be creating a moment in the clockwise direction. So 1,000 Newtons times 1 meter. Keep working across. The 500 Newton is also going to be in the clockwise direction. Okay, so I'm going to write it over here just to keep it in line. So we'll go 500 newtons at 2.5 meters. And continue all the way to the end. So I have made sure I've accounted for everything. And I have 1500 at 4 meters. And again, that's in the down, uh, sorry clockwise direction. So at this point, let's do some math. So 1,500 times 4 is going to be 6,000 Newton meters plus 500 times 2.5 is 1,250 Newton uh, meters uh, plus 1,000 times 1, 1,000 Newton meters is equal to M. And in this case, 6,000 plus 1,250 plus 1,000, uh, 8,250 is equal to M. Okay, so... One more thing that we add to our beams if we're going to analyze them. And these are known as distributed loads. So back when we had our previous beams, um, we had just those little arrows indicating one load at one location. And we would call those things point loads. Sometimes we have loads also that are spread out over a distance across the beam. And so we call those distributed loads. Now, a distributed load, when you see it on the diagram, is going to have really four important pieces of information. First of all, it's going to be the shape. Okay, And the good news is, is that at your third class level, your shape is going to be a rectangle. So we don't have a lot to play with with the different shapes. But different loads can be applied differently. So you could have a load that it increases or is heavier in the middle or something like that. Your loads are all going to be evenly distributed rectangular. You're also going to get some information. So you have that number 400 newtons per meter. And what that is, is often expressed as a lowercase w. And it's the magnitude of the load per length of, of beam. Okay, so it's going to say 400 newtons per meter of beam, if that, um, or sorry, of load. 
400 newtons per meter of load. So if that load was two meters long, the whole thing would be worth 400 times two, 800 newtons. Um, so we have also to go along with that, the length of the load, how long or what's the span of the beam that it, it, it acts on. And then where exactly is it on the beam? Is it right in the middle? Is it off to one side? Where does it start and end? And those are all important bits of information for you. Okay. When we talk about an object, we may talk about it having a center of gravity. So where does its essentially balancing point happen? So if I took some object and I tried to balance it, um, if I could find the center of gravity, then I could hold it without it tipping. And that center of gravity for an equally distributed object, uh, it, a rectangular object usually, um, is going to be right in the middle. So that's where the center of gravity acts. And that's exactly where that force would act. And so when we have a distributed load, and I've represented that with all the arrows pointing down, um, we have a location that is going to be right in the middle. So wherever the middle of that span is, half of the length is going to be where my load is located. And as I said previously, the way that we calculate the magnitude of the load is we take that W value, the the magnitude per length, um, and then we multiply it by the overall length of the object. Okay. We also have the case where we have some other objects. So as I said, you may want to understand what happens if we have an object that is not rectangular, but maybe it's triangular, or it has some other shape to it. And you could always go and find some references for these shapes. So if it's triangular, well, we know that the area of that triangle is one half length times width. And that's how much magnitude of our load is. So one half of the load times that W value is going to be the overall magnitude of the force from a triangle. In addition, a triangle is going to have a slightly different center of gravity. It's offset to the heavier side of the triangle. And so you could go to some tables and find out for different shapes. This guy is one third of the way across the length is where its center of gravity would act. And all different shapes are going to have all different, different uh, uh, values for the area as well as the location of the center of gravity. As I said before, at third class level, your, are, your distributed loads are all going to be rectangular in shape. Okay, so let's take a look at an example with a distributed load. Now, anytime we have a problem with a distributed load, it's the first thing we want to approach. It doesn't matter what type of beam it is. It doesn't matter what we're trying to solve for. If we have a distributed load, it's always the first thing that we're going to look at. What we want to do with the distributed load is change it. We want to change it from the load that's spanning across a length of the beam, and we want to replace it with one single point where that equivalent load is acting. So we have our beam here, and it looks like it has really two different sections where we have equivalent or a distributed load so we have this section here where it spans at 400 newtons per meter. And then we have another section up here where it uh, has 900 newtons per meter. Okay, so what I want to do with each is I'll just say maybe 400 newtons per meter here. Um, and what I want to be able to do is find out its equivalent. Okay, so what it looks like is this. got our, our load and it is 400 newtons per meter and if I go from my diagram it is five meters long and so my equivalent is going to be equal to five meters times 400 
newtons per meter, and this guy, I guess, would be worth 2,000 newtons. Okay. What we want to do with that is we want to put it onto our diagram. Now, sometimes we put it right on top, uh, you know, so we know that's right in the middle, um, but it can get pretty complicated with all of your dimensions. So what you'll find is that your dimensions really change once you start overlaying all of these loads. And my suggestion is just get yourself ready before you even start and get a new free body diagram set up. We know we have a load here at A. We've got a, another reaction load here at B. And now I'm ready. I'm going to put in my force so I know I have my new equivalent force that's 2000 here. And well, if I plan ahead, my my beam has two points A or B. They're both at the end, so I could pick either one as my pivot point and maybe I'm going to take take A. Okay? And so I'll take my distance from A and my distance is going to be, well, half of the, the five meters. So my, my location is going to be equal to five meters divided by two, so 2.5 meters from A. And so I have 2.5 meters as my first point. Um, so if I looked at the 900 newtons uh, per meter, so it kind of looks like this. And it's 3 meters long, and it's 900 newtons per meter. So its equivalent load is going to be worth 3 meters times 900 newtons per meter is equal to 2,700 newtons. And its location is going to be equal to, well, the 3 meters by 2, equal to 1.5 meters um, from either end. And so when I go to locate it, um, I put it up on my diagram here. I know it's over here to the right, 2,700 newtons. And maybe even I just skip ahead where I know a would have, or the, the 400 would have spanned across by 5, and then I have another 1.5, which means altogether 6.5 meters to this point, and 8 meters across total to B. So I have my new free body diagram set up. I've redrawn all of my dimensions. I've plotted out where those loads are, and Frankly, I have a much simpler looking drawing at this point, and we know how to approach this. It's a simply supported beam, which means I'm going to start out with my moments. Moments in one direction have to equal my moments in the opposite direction. I picked my pivot point as A, and I'm going to work my way across. A is at a distance of zero, so it is a zero. My 2000 is in the clockwise direction. So I'm going to write that out. So 2000 newtons times 2.5 meters. Keep on going. 2700. Again, in the clockwise direction. 6.5 meters and then when I get to the end I have B that's going in the opposite direction and that is at a distance of 8 meters. Okay so if I calculate this out uh, I have 5,000 Newton meters plus Plus 
seventeen thousand five hundred and fifty newton meters is going to be equal to b times eight meters. So twenty two thousand five hundred and fifty newton meters is equal to b times eight meters. And 2,819 newtons would be equal to B. So once I have that value down, my sum of forces up is equal to my sum of forces down. So going up is going to be A plus B, and it's going to be equal to 2,000 newtons plus 2,700 newtons. I'm going to substitute in 2,819 for B, so A plus 2,819 newtons. I guess is equal to 4,700 newtons, and A is equal to 1,881 newtons. Just go back and do a reality check. B is larger than A. And does that make sense from my diagram? Yes, it does. There's more load heav that's heavier or more concentrated at B than there is A. It makes sense that B is carrying a heavier load. Okay, so here's another example. We have a beam here. It's a simply supported beam, um, but there's a lot going on. We have a distributed load on this, and it's represented by this sort of wave form that's happening here. Okay, now this is a way that your TESS A exams or else your um, textbook um, will often represent uh, distributed loads. And it is not meaning that it's changing, so you have this sort of four peaks that it's happening. Really what that is is a rectangular distributed load. So exact same way that I've represented as a bunch of arrows across, um, you can interpret that as the exact same. Okay, so first thing that I'm going to do is we're going to deal with our distributed loads. So I have one and it is, uh, looks like 200 newtons per meter. So I'm gonna deal with my distributed load here. So my distributed load, um, I guess I'll just draw it out the same way. Um, I have 200 newtons per meter times, uh, now it's a little funky how they've drawn this out. So just gotta be careful, but uh, it is the 15 meters is what it's what it's indicating there. Okay, so times 15 meters, and what I would have is a distributed load of 3,000 newtons. Okay. Um. So I'm going to skip ahead to that next step. What did I show you? So we'll draw our free body diagram. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start sketching out. Now it is a simply supported beam, which means I can pick from either end as my starting point. And I'm going to take my reference point as my point, I guess, R1, as they've said, because that's where my distributed load is closest to. 
and it's going to be easiest for me to figure out measurements for that. So my distributed load is worth 3000 and it is a distance of I guess 15 meters divided by 2 so 7.5 meters from R1. So I've got a distance here of 7.5 meters. Okay, And now I'm going to put down the rest of the point loads on my free body diagram. Be careful that you don't get confused here. So I have a point load that's a thousand newtons and it doesn't add um, to the point load so it's not like um, you know added on to the 3000 newtons there it's its own point load and we're going to draw it in its position so it's at a five meter mark so it's actually to the left here um, so a thousand newtons and uh, that guy was at a distance of five meters I'm going to continue across the beam until I find my next, which is my 2000. It's over here. And it's at a distance of 20. And then finally, all the way across is 20 plus 10, uh, 30 to get to R1. Simply support it beam, so that means that I'm going to use my sum of moments. So sum of moments in one direction has to equal all of the moments in the other direction. So starting out from R1, R1 is at a distance of zero, so it doesn't count. And I have a thousand at a distance of five, just for size I'm going to ignore the units they're all in newtons and meters so that's going to mean either newtons or meters as my final answer plus 3000 at a distance of 7.5 plus 2000 at a distance of 20 is going to be equal to r1 at a distance of 30 Oh, I just realized I made a mistake. This shouldn't be R1, it should be R2. Okay, so if I continue with my math, 1,000 times 5, so 5,000 plus 3 times 7, or 3,000 times 7.5, uh, so 22,000. 500 plus 40,000 is going to be R2 at 30. Um, so 5,000 plus 22,500 plus 40,000 gives me 67,500 is equal to R2 times 30 and R2 is going to be equal to 2250 and I guess those would be Newtons and careful to make sure we have our units. So once we've done that we can then use our sum of forces up has to equal all of our forces down. So up is going to be R1 plus R2 it's going to be equal to my downs, 1,000 plus 3,000 newtons plus 2,000 newtons. And I'll substitute in my 22.5 for R2. So R1 is equal to, uh, I guess those are 6,000 newtons minus 22.50 newtons. And R1 is going to be equal to... 3750 newtons. Okay, so then just a quick check which side has the higher load 
Um, it appears because it has the 1000 and the 3000 uh, close to R1, it should be larger and we can see that R1 is a larger value. So I have some confidence in that number that I haven't made a mistake or confused my, my values. As long as my math was good, I think that my number should be 